Hello, and welcome to Indie Author Fringe. Get your book out there, How to Be Everywhere, number one, with Draft Digital and Kobo. My name is Mark Lefebvre. I'm the Director of Author Relations and Self-Publishing for Kobo, and I'm here with my good friend and colleague, Kevin Tumlinson, who is the Director of Marketing for Draft Digital. Kevin, so welcome to the Indie Author Fringe. It's very good to be here. It's amazing how well we go together. Um, whenever we do anything, right, Mark? That's true. It's it's like <laughs> peanut butter and jam, like chocolate. Kobo and, and D to D. Jam. I mean, that's <laughs> yeah, Kobo and D to D together <laughs> for you, the author. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, the the plan is, Kevin and I are going to have a conversation uh, about some of the things that we uh, have helped authors with in terms of ensuring that they can get their books wide. Uh, and I'll just summary for the uh, for this topic is: Draft to Digital and Kobo can both help you take your books to international markets. But we do work in different ways, even though we are both yeah. very attractive uh, companies and attractive men that work for these companies. Right. Uh, so we're we going to explain the difference between an aggregator such as draft to digital and a retailer like Kobo talk about strategies and the importance of going wide. So, Kevin, um, I, I think that's one of the biggest uh, confusing things that happens to me when I go out and talk to authors is um, they have choices, They have, yeah. uh, which is fantastic. They can go direct with some retailers and they can use an aggregator. What is draft to digital? How do you guys define yourselves? Okay, so an aggregator in general is, uh, well, let's put it this way. We will help an author reach multiple platforms at one time. And Kobo just happens to be one of those platforms. You can c get to Kobo through us. Uh, probably better to go direct to Kobo in a lot of cases. I'm just gonna throw that out there. But, uh, cause you know, Mark's sitting right in front of me. Uh, but we can actually help you get to other retailers aside from Kobo, such as Apple, iBooks, uh, Barnes & Noble, Tolino, uh, which is in an international market. Um, so that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we do. We do conversion and we do distribution to multiple uh, platforms, Kobo included. So. Okay, and, and just so that authors are, are aware, and, and, and there's a joke that we have, because draft to digital and Kobo <laughs> Writing Life, which is the team that I, uh, that I had up at Kobo, are, are very similar in our author-centric approach. We're, yeah. we're there to try to basically help enable authors for success. Um, and so our tool or our platform is built right into Kobo so you can publish directly to Kobo. Um, for, because most people are familiar with it, it's kind of like KDP, without the select and without all of that exclusivity jazz. Of course, it's also quite beautiful, and, and that's uh, something that draft digital does have in common with Kobo is yeah. the um, easy user interface, meaning you can uh, relatively easily in a number of four or five steps uh, enter your metadata, upload your content, uh, have free conversion, and uh, publish directly to the platform. Now, I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about this because this is something I'm completely – honest to authors about. We at Kobo Writing Life have a free EPUB conversion program where yeah. you can upload a doc or docx or an open office or even a Mobi file without DRM on it and we will convert it to EPUB for free for you. However, as an author myself, knowing how much we paid to have this thing developed for us, and even though it is a decent free conversion tool, um, if you don't follow the guidelines 100%, garbage in, garbage out. So right. I actually, as an author, because I also use draft to digital because I can't get into Nook directly because I'm a Canadian, and I don't own a Mac, so uh, I pulled out all my hair trying to uh, use uh, iBooks directly. <laughs> so I used draft to digital myself to, to, to get into Nook and iBooks. But I also find that the draft to digital free EPUB conversion is the best one I have I've ever used. So oh. I actually use that, and then I manually adjust my uh, EPUB file with uh, Sigil, which was just a little bit of WYSIWYG editing. Yeah. And then I upload those to Kindle and, uh, and Kobo. So and I think, <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's talk well, about Well, I was going to say, that, that, process. that is at the heart of what we, w why we exist, of course, and uh, to make it easier. And we are... Uh, you know, we're all about author choice. That's why we never require the author to, to you know, stick with us th for distribution. You can use our conversion tool and go go direct with Kobo, for example. Or if you're in the U.S. and you have a Mac or whatever, uh, you can uh, it, we can help you with that uh, for Apple iBooks, that sort of thing. But um, as far as, like, our dashboard and everything, what one of the benefits 
with going uh, with us for uh, wide distribution is that we consolidate everything into one dashboard for you. Uh, so you can see all your sales on every channel and you can see all your uh, royalties that are due and get all of that in one place. And it's a nice, easy process. Um, and as Mark pointed out, it, it is kind of handy when you're in a market and you can't reach a, a specific vendor. Uh, we can help you with that because we, we cross those borders. So now Kobo, I, I will admit, I, you guys have a very easy interface too. So I like, you know, most authors I know like to go direct to Kobo, <laughs> well, which hey, is fine is, by me. <laughs> and this is okay. It's okay if we're in the mutual admiration society because That's true. I think, uh, and, and this is an important element, and this is an important element of the concept of going wide, and it's an important element for authors to remember, is it's okay to respect and admire um, yeah. other people in the industry. I mean, I expect it, uh, I, I expect, I respect and admire uh, the good things that draft to digital um, and other aggregators are doing for authors, because at the end of the day, um, it's less of a competition and and more of um, all you know uh, rising tides raise all boats uh, yeah. in that way. And and I think indie authors, most indie authors, have that attitude that they're not really competing against one another for sales; they're competing against. Um, People not reading at all, uh, for example, right. or something like right. that, or doing other activities. So you, you spoke a little bit about this before, and it's kind of important. I want people to know. So um, Tolino is a major retailer in Germany because we're talking right. about going wide. And Germany is the, the second largest book uh, industry in the world, book market in the world. Frankfurt Book Fair happens in Germany. And the reason right. that it's the premier book fair, bigger than Book Expo America, bigger than London Book Fair, Frankfurt is the world hub for publishing. Um, and Tolino is an alliance of independent bookstores that right. came together and wanted to have a, a, a native born solution for ebooks. And Draft to Digital has had a good relationship with Tolino for, for several years now, correct? Very good, yeah. Very good, yeah. And, uh, we, and one of the great things about that market is for, um, you know, let's just pick on American authors for a second. I mean, uh, translation is always kind of a question, you know. Everyone always asks about that. And I, I always encourage people to get translations if you can. Um, there are some cautions you might want to take. Uh, sometimes in terms of intellectual property law, you, you may want to do a little research because <laughs> sometimes you can end up signing – uh, rights over. Um, but one of the great things about the German market is a lot of them are native English speakers anyway. So you don't necessarily have to, to uh, do a translation. Now, it's generally appreciated. And uh, I think you actually have something of a leg up when you do it. Mark, you may know something about that too, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, English books do sell in the German market, of course. Yeah. You know, it, it's a much larger German uh, rating uh, audience there. Right. We, we, uh, I mean, one of the things you're going to want to do when you're thinking about a country, let's pick on Germany for now, um, with both draft to digital and if you're publishing through Cobra Writing Life, you have the ability to control your euros, not just enter a U.S. price, right? not right. just enter pounds or Canadian dollars. Uh, but I, I would implore authors to take advantage of, uh, of that because you need to make sure that your pricing is competitive and attractive in that currency and that it looks natural to a consumer in that market. Right. And uh, we'll, and I believe Kobo does this too, right? Uh, we'll, we can recommend a price based on your U S price, for example, or Canadian uh, price. Um, but it, it's really a kind of across the board, better to go and do a little research, find books that are similar to yours and see how they're priced uh, yeah. to the, to the, sense total, you know, make, make sure it does make, for example, in the U S in particular, I mean, if you see a price and it ends in something other than 99 cents, something seems off, you know, you never see right. something priced as $10 and 47 cents, you know, not so, outside of Walmart, not outside of Walmart, <laughs> <laughs> but that, right. and that's an important uh, stipulation that I, that I want to talk about because in, um, in, in well, what, what we found through Kobo is in, Price points in Canada, U.S., Australia, New Zealand, uh, Great Britain sometimes, right. .99 is a good price point. But we do find with the euros and the pounds uh, a little bit higher that we even find that a .49 or a .99 oh, work, oh. work well. Again, 
uh, I'm always of the mind that if a customer is going to pay, you know, four forty nine, chances are they're already rounding it up in their head to five dollars. So you may as well go yeah. to four ninety nine. It's an old customer psychology thing. And I've even had some authors uh, recommend or say, well, but I see books that are priced at twelve ninety five or whatever. So I'm going to make my book four ninety five. And to that I say, why would you leave four cents on the table? I, I know right. it seems silly. But when you're thinking about thousands of unit sales over the course of a year, or, or for right. some people, much less. But again, I'm talking to the average author, not the 1% that are making 1,000 sales every hour. Um, <laughs> that, okay, okay, it's not full $0.04, cents, right? It's, uh, it's only 70% of that $0.04, cents, but that right. adds up over time. It makes, um, it's amazing how much that can add up. What and you so, just said, actually, is the best argument for going ahead and putting that extra $0.04 cents on there because you're generally going to – pay a, a piece of your royalty to whatever channel you're distributing through. So why, you know, why don't you hedge it a little and <laughs> try yeah, to make exactly. some of that back? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's kind of funny. Even, even some of the things that we've walked, uh, we've talked about this. So uh, I'm going to take this from a U.S. author perspective because in our platform, almost 50% of our, of our users are from the U.S. Uh, and the U.S. is kind of a, a large population base in the world. Um, is a lot of folks will just set a U.S. price and then not go and uh, round that up. But what we recommend people do is, you know, let's say you're going to start with a price of um, $4.99. Our system, and I believe draft to digital also shows you what your converted price would be. So if you put in $4.99 U.S. for your base price, it's going to show you $5.62 or some weird conversion into right. Canadian, et cetera. And that's that's a good place to start because – well, all right, I'm going to round that up to the next 99. Um, but the trick is different genres sell at different price points differently. And that's why it's really difficult for, you know, an aggregator like draft to digital or a retailer like Kobo to, to have a one price fits all solution. Because right. if this is a romance novel in a particular market, it may have a preferred price point as opposed to this is a, um, a a technical manual, a non you know, to, to, to go to, you know, like right. a, a technical programming manual, or maybe an academic book, or maybe even just a, a different genre, right? Like a fantasy novel and a romance novel. Uh, well, how long is the book? Um, right. What are the other books? And that's where the, it, we would recommend in the author's best interest of understanding the market, go and look at the best seller titles in that category, right. in that market. You can do it on Amazon easily. But now you can do it on Kobo very easily. Just by when you're on the Kobo website, it will default to your you know, U.S. or U.K. or Canadian store. You'll see your little flag of your home country. If you click on the flag, you now have the ability to click on and see up to 18 different territories, what it would look like. Uh, so you click on New Zealand, for example, or Germany. And you can see what your book would look like in the German store. You'll see the ranking, which is different there. You'll see uh, the currency, so you can actually see that ugly price if you haven't manually controlled it. But then you can also look and say, okay, my book's in this category. What are the top 10, top 20 books in this category, in this country? What's the average price point? And then you can d determine for yourself what a reasonable price is. And I always recommend try and find something in the middle, not too high, yeah. not too little. It's like the Goldilocks of, of book price setting, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to find an average. I mean, that would be, that would be helpful. You know, don't just, don't just price out the best sellers because those have a higher demand, you know, we'll take a look at some of the, those that are kind of maybe considered mid list, which is pr probably going to be where most authors land and, okay. uh, and start comparing and averaging prices there. And, it, it, you know, pricing is such a weird conversation to have with authors because, you know, I just read something on uh, Writer's Cafe today. Uh, you know, the guy wants to uh, reclaim, I don't know, I, I don't know if he's on a mission, but, he you know, he wants us to start asking for nine ninety nine for books, um, okay. which I... <laughs> I do sympathize with <laughs> as an author myself. I want to make more money, but hey, seven uh, I also in your pocket doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I won't turn it down. You know, but readers uh, also like to keep seven dollars in their pocket. So uh, there's more to consider than just the, you know, sort of the whims of the of the industry um, of the authors themselves. But, um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, from uh, from the stats that we can see at Kobo, um, 
another thing I like to recommend to authors is whether or not you have a print book, look at the yeah. print book and make sure your ebook price I like to see as a consumer myself, so it's sort of a default that I have, is the ebook fifty percent about fifty right. percent cheaper than the hardcover or the, the paperback uh, version of the book. And if you're and if it's not, then maybe your price too high. And if it's yeah. way more than fifty percent cheaper, maybe your price too low. So that's another like a bunch of different yardsticks <laughs> to try and measure. Right. It's, it's it's not it's not a, an easy science, unfortunately. This is a lesson that the uh, traditional publishing world has not quite adhered to um, <laughs> because <laughs> I am frequently seeing uh, books priced at the same price as their hardcover editions or something and. I do. I also understand the concept behind that, but um, I think most readers are typically used to seeing about, like you said, a fifty percent markdown from a hardcover price or a paperback. And I think that's reasonable. Um, it, it's kind of funny. It almost seems like they're pricing with the anticipation of trying to drive people back to the print book. That seems well, to I, be yeah. the motivation, right? <laughs> I, I believe that is the motivation, which I think is odd considering that your margins are have to be better on a digital book. But whatever. I mean, we, we could get off on it. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's funny. <laughs> um, but I would almost want to have a whole other session on that. <laughs> um, if, if any of you guys listen to the Some More Book Show podcast, we, uh, Kevin and I have taken Publis Hill, so we, we haven't fall, fallen prey to the mahogany desk syndrome uh, yeah. that they talk about. Uh, but we won't go down that path. We won't sit behind no. that desk. I no. <laughs> wanted to share some price points, and now this is this is normalized back to uh, back to U.S. dollars. Um, yeah. And and the price point that we're seeing coming out of Kobo Writing Life last week was um, the average price point was four dollars and twenty six cents, and the average price point that we saw coming from the entire Kobo catalog was somewhere in the realm of seven dollars and eighty two cents. So this kind of shows that there's a there's a bit of a tolerance for walking your price up a little bit, but not too much. And the reason you have that diversity is uh, someone has a book, Bob, guess what? The 99 cents books are going to go through the roof, right? That's going to happen. Right. There's going to be sales. There's going to be the, the 30% off sales. There's going to be the 299s and special prices. And then there's also going to be Obviously, there's traditionally published books that are 9.99 to 16.99 to 18.99 to whatever, uh, yeah. and, and I have some traditionally published books that are, in my opinion, as the author who wrote them, far too overpriced as a digital right, book. Right. <laughs> so, but that's just me. I mean, I'm only getting my my tiny share on those, anyways. Yeah. But um, then there's the box sets because, um, and I believe this is true if you're publishing to Kobo through Draft Digital, is there's no cap on that 70%. There's no 9.99 cap. So we are seeing books, uh, box sets of $35, $45, $50. Like a, this is the complete series, like the 12 book series. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and the customer gets really good value for that, but the author still gets 70%. So that's true through Draft to Digital as well, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah. We, uh, we, we have no limitation on how you can price it. I mean, we have best practice recommendations, of course, because, uh, you know, most people aren't going to pay 50 bucks for it. Even if it's a box set, uh, well, you know what? Don't let me say that, because if it's <laughs> happening on Kobo, it's probably likely it would happen. I always advise people against that. Uh, among, but, among our top selling 25 titles each week from Kobo Writing Life, there's at least yeah. three or four. Wow. Uh, Look, I mean, I'm gonna. I gotta go change some prices Mark, real quick. Mark Dawson's. I mean, he's not. He's not going that high. But Mark Dawson's box sets that he's done, the ten book series of um, uh, the. I'm just gonna call him Jack Reacher. The ten book box. Uh, Milton. Um, John, John Milton. Milton. John Milton. The ten. You know, it's a cool name like that. Uh, the the ten book box set is doing phenomenally well. Uh, yeah. Bella Andre, Barbara Freedy, they they're they've got full, you know, eighteen book box sets. And again, because they're selling their books at four and five and six dollars each, when you put eighteen books or ten books in a box set, you're right. ripping yourself off. Yeah, you're giving the customer a great deal at ten bucks, but you're ripping yourself off <laughs> right, to send right. them to so you don't even you shouldn't even have a box set if you're gonna lose money. Um so so we're seeing that uh every week I look at the top twenty five, top hundred that are coming in through Cobra Writing Life. And I'm seeing those box sets, uh, and they're 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 doing well because what's happening is the customer. Think about it from the customer's point of view. The customer can get the entire series. They know they're going to want them. They already save money because it's going to be a little bit cheaper anyways than buying them right. individually. And then they don't have to go and re-download those. So maybe they're on vacation. Maybe they're getting on a flight. 
They don't want to finish the book and go, okay, now I got to go get the other one. It's all there for them. So it's, right. the, con- it's the pure convenience factor. Yeah. Uh, so that's really, really nice. Um, so, um, I mean, I, we were, we, there are other topics I think we need to range into, and I think you and I could probably talk price all day, but I could. want to make sure, <laughs> <laughs> I think we want to make sure that we're covering other aspects of, of distribution. Um, there are, I'm constantly asked, uh, a question I get asked frequently anyway, is whether or not um, an author should be exclusive to a platform or go wide to all platforms, be exclusive to a region or go global. Um, I would love to hear your take on that because I, I know my answer is by rote, but I can, I can uh, <laughs> appreciate because you, you, you're you going to have a different perspective on this. Of course, we want you to go wide because we're every yeah. platform and all over the globe. So how does Kobo look at this? I actually don't think that our perspective is all that much different. Uh, yeah. At the end of the day, I mean, I am an author, and I was hired by Kobo to come up with a solution for authors. And so yeah. I always try to. My first question is, is this good for authors? And yeah. I don't, yes, of course, we like to have some exclusivity and we like to be able to brag and say, hey, we have something nobody else has. And we do get that in some ways with maybe some uh, additional bonus content, meaning yeah. give us something that our customers can value, but doesn't take away from other customers. Because at the end of the day, your job as an author is to make yourself as broadly and widely available to as many consumers as possible to satisfy them as readers. That's that's your goal as a writer. And even when authors approach us and say, we want to be exclusive to Kobo, my first question is, why? Why would you want to limit yourself? Yes, we're an amazing right. company. Yes, we're beautiful people and we do great work and we are global. But what if there's a reader who... who what if there's a reader who only reads on Kindle or on Nook? How are yeah. you helping sure that your book gets into their hands? So even as a retailer, um, when we've had exclusivity opportunities, sure, we take advantage of them and, and we work to try and get extra promotions for the yeah. consumer. But it's usually with a, at a limited time period. Even when we commissioned Joanna Penn to write some uh, short fiction for Dante's uh, yeah. for, for, I'm still for, waiting yeah, on yeah. my commission, by the way. I know. Someone for when commission me. <laughs> hey, you never know. With <laughs> serendipity, it just happens like that. Um, but you know what I mean? Even even though she wrote them for us and we paid her for those, the rights reverted back to the author so that she could properly take advantage of this uh, intellectual uh, content yeah. that she'd created. Um, so no, I think I think the concept of going wide, the the biggest frustration that we deal with on a regular basis through our customer care team is we have a a, a customer find an author, start reading their books, and then find out this author has another book, and then they contact us and say, well, why isn't this in the catalog? So that usually comes over to us, and then we look into it. Now sometimes it's a rights issue if it's a traditionally published book, meaning Random House. U.S. about the rights, but it's not available in Europe, which in which case we can help because you can actually specify only certain territories when you're publishing through Cobra Writing Life. So you can be a pure hybrid on the same title, yeah. um, which works really, really well. But oftentimes, you know, you'll, you'll find that the uh, author delisted it to go into KDP Select. So we're reaching out to them saying, hey, you got a customer interested in buying your book. Are you coming back? <laughs> Yeah. And oh, I'm so glad to hear you guys do that. That's a <laughs> that's a really that cool thing. What's that? <laughs> you have to do that as well. Uh, you know, we don't reach out to them and say we have a customer looking for your book. I, I honestly, I think it would be difficult for us to do that because we we're not privy to everyone's sales necessarily sure. and, and, and reading through us. So um, to hear the, a retailer say that though is very that's very heartening because I I would I I. I tampered with that for a bit, you know, I pulled out and went to KDP select and, and saw some benefit from it. But if someone had approached me and said, <laughs> look, people were trying to buy your book what, that used to be listed here. I mean, I, that would, yeah. that would make me pause. <laughs> it, it's it's so. funny. Cause I, I get a uh, mixed reaction, right? I mean, I was the kid yeah. in high school that couldn't get a date or couldn't get someone to go to the prong with me. So it feels like that in many ways. It's like, hi, Kevin, <laughs> could you please consider publishing a book? Because we would really, right. we have, it's like, Oh, get out of here. You loser. Um, <laughs> so that's some of the reaction. Although uh, it's amazing. Uh, I will often get uh, very positive reactions from authors going, Oh, that that's awesome to hear. 
what author doesn't want to hear that someone wants to read their work? Right, right? exactly right. Um, yeah. And I've even had authors who said, oh, my God, I'm locked in, uh, you know, accidentally, because they, they do make it hard for you to remember that you have to click the button um, to yeah. opt out. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God, I accidentally opted in for the next three months. And, and I've had authors say, um, I'm more than happy. Do you want to just give them my book? Uh, yeah. you know, so we've, we've been able to say, yeah, okay. So I, I talked to customer care because we still have the, if we'd had the EPUB in, in the catalog saying, we're just going to add this EPUB to your library, courtesy right. of the author who wants you to keep reading. And thanks so much for your interest. Um, yeah. so I've had, I've had authors be very kind and thoughtful to their, uh, to the readers in that way. Cause at the end That's of the day, you gotta smart. remember our job, our main job at Kobo is and, and authors don't take this the wrong way. Our main job is to provide readers great books to read. That is yeah. our job. That's what we're here for. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, sometimes you always think, oh, it's always about the author or whatever. Well, why don't they do this? Why don't they do that? Most of our decisions are driven by what can we do to give our readers a really good experience. Now, fortunately yeah. for me and my position, my focus is what can we do to help authors be successful right, and help right. authors get in touch with those readers in as many so, ways as that's that brings up a very interesting difference between retailers and aggregators um, in that we as an aggregator, at least I can't speak for everyone else. I know there are other aggregators out there, but I know that our focus is entirely on that author. Um, now, the author needs to be focused on, on the reader and the retailer needs to be focused on the reader, reader. So we're kind of free to do that, uh, to say, look, we're built all around the author needs. And we're built around making things simple and easy for that author. Um, so those are those, they're two different approaches. They're not really different approaches fundamentally. I mean, they kind of come around to the same idea, just coming from different directions. So if you're looking for the difference between the two, that's a key difference. But I, I for sure. it's compatible. <laughs> well, it, it's a key difference because your focus is building everything you can for the reader, right. or for the for the for a writer. And we're, we're, we as a retailer, our focus is building everything we right. can for the reader. And that makes that relationship work perfectly right. as two sides of the same and coin. That's, yeah. and, that's, and that's a brilliant differentiation. Well, there, we I also we just, have our... I think we just defined it properly for the entire... I think we did. I think we did. We, <laughs> we built a framework. And, and, you know, we have our... That's the, the relationship we should have is, you know, we're trying to empower not just the author, but we are trying to empower the retailer as well. Um, when we come in, you know, Drafts of Digital has... 100,000 books in its catalog, and that's nothing to sneeze at, and um, that's a big help, I think, to a lot of the retailers. So they have sure. one account with a large volume, and we don't cause any headaches. In fact, we deal with a lot more headaches so that yeah. they don't get through <laughs> to you guys. <laughs> and, 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 that is a, and that is a benefit. Um, so, for example, um, if we need uh, a big volume of titles in a particular category or whatever, right. um, I could go and have some contact authors one by one by one by one by one by one, or I call Kevin and say, yeah. we're looking for books on this theme. What do you got for next month? <laughs> he can right. easily say one phone call to a single vendor to a single account could get me the 300 titles I want or 300 phone calls, right? Yeah. So sometimes there's that, um, there's a benefit to us to reach out to a single right. source for content. And on the author side, the, the good news for the author is that if you are an author in that, on that topic, your chances are much higher, which when, when I talk to people about author marketing, one of the things I, I tell them is that marketing is all about improving your odds. It's all about improving the odds that your book is going to land in front of the right reader. Um, so being a part of an aggregate can be beneficial to you in that regard. Now, if you're if you're already direct with Kobo, I mean, you know, Mark's going to go and look at their catalog and see who they already represent, and you get sort of a first dibs kind of thing. I would assume I would want that as an author. <laughs> yes. uh, so I would assume that that Kobo does that the smart company that they are. But then when uh, you want to offer that same deal to thirty. You know, I don't know, maybe not 30,000, but maybe 10,000 authors, uh, it's a little tougher because sometimes you don't have that many in a single vendor. Yeah, exactly. I mean, our, and, and this is the challenge that uh, people often find when they say, well, I'm, I'm with draft to digital should I go direct? And I say, you know what? That's completely up to you. Yeah, here is. are the pros. Here are the cons. Here are the, here are the reasons why you want. Here are the reasons why you may not want to. 
Um, but I think it works out. Uh, I, I mean, I always say, well, try both and see what you prefer because you know you're gonna. It's gonna cost you more time. Uh, do you yeah. have the time to deal with it? Um, or or maybe there's going to be things you won't have access to, um, right. or or whatever, right? Um, so well, for it, all the trade-offs, going with an aggregator really is all about consolidating things to an, a, a, a simpler. You know, single step solution. It's not the best solution for you uh, financially because we take a cut of royalties, but it is. It isn't that painful to do that. That's more of a convenience fee. But the you know the advantage of going direct is that you keep more of your profit. Uh, it just means there's always a trade off. Time and money are are two objects that that sort of work in tandem, and you're going to trade one or the other. So if you're willing to trade the, t- the time, you'll make more money, but the, the inverse is also true. If you can spend the money, uh, if you're willing to spend the money, you reclaim time. And for an author, time means you know more books, more yeah. chances to go on podcasts or, uh, or webinars and promote your work. You know, time is pretty valuable in that you, know, you can make more money, but you can't make more time. So there oh, is like an that. argument. <laughs> <laughs> get a T-shirt where they can make more money, but you I can't make more time. <laughs> right. At least not yet. I think physics may be on that. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm going to upgrade from my you can pick your friends T-shirt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I want to share a couple other opportunities about going wide. So, yes, we all know, you know, Kindle offers special things and they only offer them to you if you're part of a program or if you make your books. Right exclusive but there are other retailers doing other things that are great for expanding your distribution and making your work available to other markets and i think that both our companies are participating in kobo's uh, kobo plus program which is for the yeah. subscriptions into the netherlands and belgium uh, which are two uh, key demographic uh, areas where we realized that there was a huge group of potential readers who weren't buying ebooks currently because it wasn't the a la carte, you know, single purchase for single ebook was not yeah. the model they wanted. They wanted an all you can consume uh, platform. So after two years of research into recognizing this was not going to cannibalize our business, because the Netherlands and our partner Bull, uh, they're a major player in, in that space. Uh, we offered the subscription service and allowed Cobra Writing Life authors the ability to opt in mm-hmm. directly through Cobo Writing Life on a one-by-one basis uh, with comparisons, obviously, to Kindle Unlimited, with the exception yeah. that you don't have to be exclusive to Kobo in order to be in this program. Um, and also, uh, as I understand it, Drafted Digital also has the ability to allow authors to opt into subscriptions if you're publishing to Kobo through Drafted Digital, correct? Right, right. Right. We're uh, kind of putting a few final, final touches on that, I think, but we're, we're excited to be a, a part of that program because that, to, on, to our thinking, I mean, that's now we're starting to edge into the territory where we can offer the same sorts of advantages that we being us and Kobo, I mean, we can offer the same sorts of advantages that people get by being in KDP Select. Uh, yeah. So it's a very exciting time. I, I, as soon as I heard the news, I, I was all over the blogosphere about that. So, <laughs> uh, so that's that's kind of interesting, and that's global because that's, that's global. allowing um, what we're doing is we're looking into markets that are very much uh, add-on rather than mm-hmm. take away from. And obviously, the Netherlands is one. And the biggest question I've had from authors, apart there have been other questions, but the biggest question is when are you going to make it available in in the U.S.? When are you going to make it available? Whatever. Right. Well, let's be honest. We're not going to make it available if it's not going to be successful for right. readers, for publishers, for authors, and for the retailer. It has, to be, it has to be something where we all win. And we also built a model where we can't lose money, no matter how big it gets, no matter how small it gets. There are other subscription services where you know, they had to stop romance readers from reading because they couldn't afford to keep up with the demand. Yeah. Uh, ours is a pure revenue share model, meaning you know, um, 40, 40% in the basic terms, 40% is held by Kobo, uh, you know, 20% is going to Bull, our, our retail partner, 20% is going with Kobo, and then the rest of the 60% is going to the publisher. And that publisher is, you know, the, you know, the aggregator, the author, depending on how, if they're coming through, right. you know, a traditional publisher, the publisher's getting that, and however they've figured out how they're going to give that to their authors, they're giving it to 
Um, so that way, regardless of how big it is or how many books people read, we don't lose money. And that's a key right. fact. So it's scalability, which is, which yeah. is critical. And that concept of, uh, you know, no one makes money unless everyone makes money. I mean, that's, that's the best policy when it comes to this stuff because uh, it gives us all incentive to work for each other, which is whenever you're in a cooperative environment like that, everyone, everyone benefits. Um, even those who may not be making as much you know, on book sales benefit from, from that model. Um, it's in, you know, frankly, that's the draft to digital model has been all along. I mean, we never make money unless the authors make money. <laughs> so that's the be. best way to operate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. As an author, I really appreciate it. <laughs> of course. That's awesome. Now I want to call, I want to call out, uh, two things really quickly. I'm just going to remind folks that, uh, overdrive, which is a retail, uh, library market is something that we have. We're in beta phase two testing, of getting Kobo Writing Life books into the library market, and it has just exploded, even though we still have less than a 1,000 titles that are opted into the system because we're still figuring out the reporting. And even though these authors are in the system, they're not actually seeing their sales except through yeah. a weird manually generated Excel spreadsheet. So we're still figuring that out to, to make it easier. Uh, but it's amazing that we're seeing sales in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, Malaysia uh, as well, because Overdrive, while they're a huge North American uh, centric uh, company with a lot of library markets in North America, they do have a global market share. So that's yeah. something that's coming. But the other thing that, and I say this as an author, and I even say this as a retailer, that draft to digital has created this amazing books to read dot com, where um, you can actually very easily create a single link. Because what I used to do is I would go and make my ebook on draft to digital. Yeah. Then I would manually go into my Kindle version or my Mobi version and I would manually add the links to Kindle and then I would go to my Kobo version and manually add the links to Kobo. But in the meantime, Insanity. all the way along, draft to digital was doing that for us by automatically sending the right links to the right retailers, which is perfect. But now that you have books to read, I can have a, a single URL for my book and I can have a single version of my EPUB and I can send that everywhere. Um, yeah. and the consumer, well, look, I, I'm, I'm loving this uh, process and I think more authors should use it, but I think, uh, Kevin, tell us the motivation behind like books to read. Like you guys built this for authors. Let's, yeah. I'd love to hear yeah. more about it. I mean, that's an ongoing growing project for us, uh, books to read. I mean, it, eventually it will, the site itself will be aimed at the readers, but we provide all those tools and the universal book links are like a favorite tool, man. I mean, that, that was my when I came on board with these guys, that was the first thing I had to hand in, and uh, it was promoting that. Um, and it is uh, every bit the tool that I think all authors were looking for. Because, like you, I mean, I'm I'm sure you did the same thing. If I sent out an email to my mailing list and I'm <laughs> promoting my latest book, it's got you know 13, 14 different links to all the different stores. Which you know sometimes uh, email clients will catch that as spam. So that was problematic. Um, or I'd have to send people to a landing page with all those links. And then that was one more click between them and, and making a purchase. And, you know, at the, game, the name of the game in marketing is reducing the number of, of barriers between your customer and your product, right? So that's what this does. And it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, it's, um, it allows the reader to select their storefront of choice and even the region of choice and make that their default if they choose. So if you are, you know, if you prefer to read on Kindle and you live in the UK, you can say every time I click a UBL, I want to go to the UK storefront. And then from that point on, it goes directly to the product page for that book uh, with, you know, a single click. And that same link will work for the Kobo readers, will work for the iBook readers, and you can use it on print materials without ever worrying about it going out of style. You can customize it uh, so it's easy to remember. Uh, so if you talk about it on podcasts or whatever, you can rattle it right off. Yeah, so books so to many read slash advantages. title. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. For yeah. example, books to read dot com slash Atlantis Riddle is a book you might have heard. You might want to check out. Uh, <laughs> blatant self promo. But it no, also I'm gives excited. A, about, you know, it, go ahead. I'm sorry. It gives the it gives the the the, the writer they can see 
the preferred clicks. They could see the top three yeah, retailers that are being clicked on. Right. So you go, wow, I did this promo, and wow, I didn't realize that many people clicked on the iBooks link or the Kobo link or Which the Nook link or whatever it was. It definitely help you in far in terms of um, you know deciding where to invest for marketing. Um, if you, for example, you know Facebook ads, I used to have to target the different platforms. And and that cost me a lot in overhead uh, for my right. Facebook ads. And now I don't have to target for a specific platform. I can target the readers directly, which is smarter uh, right. all around. And uh, and the same ad will work you know, regardless of what platform that reader um, prefers. So I get to see the data also when people click through. I get to see which storefronts they prefer. And so if if I see that most of my readers are, are buying on Kobo – then I I know I can I can start cultivating that relationship you know I yeah. can start utilizing that uh, either by nurturing the uh, the Kobo readers you know focusing more you know focusing ads on them or whatever uh, maybe when promos are available I can point out that you know I have ex- I know exactly how many of my readers go to Kobo on average so right. there's there are a lot of advantages to that um, just having the ability to to track that is just it was something kind of cool to begin with. <laughs> For sure. So. The other thing cool because there may be authors listening to this who are not smart enough to be using Draft to Digital or Kobo, or they are a traditionally published author who are just looking for different marketing techniques. Yeah, and yeah. As, as an author who does have traditionally published titles, I can tell you, I have a, uh, a universal book link or a UBL from uh, bookstoread.com for every single one of my books that's, in, uh, that's available, as well as in print. Um, whether it's one that I own the rights to myself, whether it's one I'm publishing through draft to digital whether it's one that is traditionally published. And I find that so much easier. I just updated the about the author page and, and I need to go back and redo everything and go, I'm just going to put all these, because then I don't have to, you know, as a you new never retailer. never have to worry about it again. Yeah. If a new yeah. retailer comes along, then I got to go and build a new link to it. But books true, right. you know, you can, it, it refreshes not automatically when you hit the button, it actually goes out and finds new links, which is, uh, which is quite amazing uh, that I could do that because it doesn't limit me depending on how I prefer to publish. If I yeah. prefer to traditionally publish, it doesn't limit me. If I prefer to self-publish, it doesn't limit me. Even if I'm not a customer of draft to digital I can still use this free tool. So, okay. I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's an amazing opportunity I want to make sure authors take advantage of. You, uh, you brought up Overdrive, but I don't know if we necessarily told people what Overdrive is and what it does. Um, the fact that you guys have a program with them is is awesome. Uh, it, it is coveted. Uh, so why don't you kind of talk about that for a second? And yeah, sure. Um, well, Overdrive is a <laughs> Overdrive is a company in uh, in Cleveland, uh, and they are a significant player in the retail uh, in the retail in the library market, and so. Overdrive powers a lot of different library systems with digital books. And so because Overdrive is owned by Rakuten, which is the company that owns Kobo, we have created a partnership whereby Kobo Writing Life uh, authors can opt their titles into the Overdrive market. Now they have to set a unique library price. Yeah. Uh, but then libraries have the ability to purchase it. Overdrive pays Kobo. Kobo then adds that to the Kobo Writing Life author's account. Uh, and again, we're still in the beta process because what's happening is the, the way that the payments are coming in and the way they're get, getting attributed is right now it's looking like it's a quarterly uh, system in right. terms of getting them that uh, money. And even the reporting, uh, we have a project in the works for improving our dashboard, you know, fixing the free tracking, adding pre-order tracking, and then adding overdrive tracking so you can actually see where what libraries where because when we send the spreadsheet to you it shows you the city the library name how many units they bought um, and the nice thing about the library market um, is that traditional publishers are typically charging you know two or three times the retail price of the book so given right. their average retail price you know a, a you know a book from Random House for example could cost upwards of thirty five forty five dollars to a library. So even an indie author who sets a library price of ten or twelve dollars, um, yeah. they could buy two or three copies of your book for the same price as one. So uh, an early example is so Diane Capri is a, is you know was one of our early beta users of the program and, and obviously one of our best sellers because you've got you know three hundred people on your waiting list at the LA Library for the new Jack Reacher, 
Well, yeah. do you want to read the Hunt for Jack Reacher? Do you want to want to get your Reacher fix? Great, you can get that same style of great, you know, authorized fiction from Diane Caprey, and she's got ten books in that series that, right, you know, right. So the library can purchase them for uh, less of a price and then satisfy, because the library's goal is to satisfy readers. And when they have 300 people on the waiting list, they want to, you know, what can they offer them? What else can they, while, while I'm waiting, what else can I read? And so we're doing, what we're doing is, you know, taking more of a sales rep approach is Shana on the, on the Cobra Writing Life team is looking at what are these books like? So we've got, okay, so you've read your Jack Reacher, and you're waiting for the next one. So you've got Diane Capri, you've got Mark Dawson, you've got XXX, you've got all these different authors that we can suggestively recommend to the libraries. So yeah. we're, pretty, we're pretty excited about uh, a new way of, so the U.S. retail market, as we saw through author earnings, the U.S. retail market is kind of locked in and sewn up by, you know, the world's biggest river. But right. uh, <laughs> there, are other, there are other digital markets in the U.S. that you know, uh, you can even go wide within your own country. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I think I just heard like four, four or 5,000 author heads explode at once when they um, heard libraries and heard that they can potentially get in from you guys. So uh, that's exciting. That's always been exciting. As soon as I saw the announcement um, uh, about Overdrive, I, I thought that's a game changer. So very cool. Um, I think we're kind of at our our yeah, time, right? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunate, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think the two things we should I know because we both have uh, places uh, available. Um, where would people find out more about Draft to Digital? You can so. Oh, I don't know what that noise is. Uh, so uh, so Draft Digital just digital dot com. Although I've been informed that the um, we have a new miss. So if you just type Draft to Digital in just about any version, you can you should be able to get to us. And sure, how about yeah. uh, yeah. Now, how about that? Kobo. <laughs> how about Kobo? <laughs> KoboWritingLife.com will take you to our blog and podcast where there's lots of information such as price tips. And then there's a there's a, there's a a button there, big giant um, our, our, our ball red uh, quill for Kobo Writing Life. And uh, you can click on to sign into your Kobo Writing Life account from there or sign up if you don't have one. And that's it. Well, that's thanks, ag- for, uh, ag- thanks for the chat, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. I'm glad you kind of took the lead. I'm glad you did. We, uh, <laughs> I think it worked out great. So great talking to everybody. Take care, guys.